Hi, Ellie here from The Dark Imp, helping parents reclaim family time by playing board games together. Now we all know that even with the best intentions, family board gaming is not always plain sailing. There can frequently be arguments or tears or messy explosions that take out the whole board and cause a real problem. And we want to avoid these as much as possible because the more this happens, the less likely the family is to want to get to the table. That The first step in avoiding these problems is really to identify what the triggers are for your family. Now they might be different in every, every single house might have a different trigger or set of triggers. So when, when this happens next time for you, have a real look, really try and analyse what's happening and see if you can work out whether you know what the cause of this particular problem has been in this video i'm going to give you eight possible triggers that might that might cause bad feeling in your family and these are things to look out for see if this happens in your family okay so the first possible trigger is if, if you've got a player that constantly whines or whines when they're when they feel like they're being badly treated whines when they're or moans when they things don't go their way when they don't get the cards they want when they don't get to go in the position they want this can wear down the other players and it can cause them to treat that player differently and this sort of behavior then swings the game in that person's favor the moany person's favor and causes them to possibly win. Now you could see that moaning or whining about your situation then creates a winning strategy and you don't want the way you win to be moaning and whining because it causes problems for everybody else. Nobody likes it. It causes arguments. You know, she only won because I let her. You don't want that kind of argument. So is that happening in your house? Identify if that's a problem. We can also also see lots of uh, arguments or tension when we are teaching games, when we're introducing new games to players. So some games have quite a lot of rules and really you don't want to be sitting around for a long time explaining every single rule. That can cause problems in itself. So one of the strategies we employ is to teach as we go along in the game. And that's a really good idea, but it can cause problems of its own. So if you're teaching rules, you need to plan in advance when you're going to teach them, because there's nothing worse than a play that than being told, oh, when when I'm about to do something and I know how to play the game, oh, I'm going to do this. I didn't tell you I could do this, but that's what you can do this. And this is a rule I'm telling you now. So a good example that you might know of is in chess there you can do castling. And um, so that's switching the position of the rook and the king. And that's the only time you can move two pieces on your turn. And there are certain situations that enable you to do that. That's a rule you might not mention right at the beginning of the game. It's a rule you might bring in later. But you don't want the time to, that you bring it in to be when you're doing it, because then other players just think, well, that's rubbish. I think, that, you know, if I'd have known that, I might have done that. So try, if you're going to teach the rules as you go along, make sure that all the players know that this is a teaching game and the results don't matter or plan very carefully that you're going to manage to teach all the rules in the first few turns even if that means stopping and starting. Uh, so that's a possible cause of problems. We, I see a lot of issues when players interfere with the spirit of the game. It, something may be all right in terms of the rules. It may be a valid thing to do, but it's not quite what the game was designed for. So let me give you an example. There's a game called Ticket to Ride, which you've uh, seen me talk about in other videos. And it's a great family game. Uh, it's very straightforward. You have certain destination cards, that, routes that you're trying to get to. So there are, there are places on the map and you're trying to connect certain points to give you some uh, certain certain places on the map to give you points. And you have a, num a certain number of trains that you can place to claim these routes. The standard strategy is to get as many 
either as, as many um, as many destinations as you can, so as many routes as you can. You also get points for the trains you put on the map, and that will give you uh, a lot more points at the end of the game, so that the two different things you add together, and this gives you a good score. It is possible to do the bare minimum number of routes and to look and see where everybody else needs to connect on the board and just place trains, which you get points for, to stop your other your opponents winning their destinations, which costs them. It doesn't stop them, it doesn't just stop them being able to connect their destination, but they get negative points for each destination card they have that they can't complete. This is a very aggressive strategy for what is not supposed to be a very aggressive game. And you will win no friends, and it's not at all in the spirit of the game, but you will win the game. But it's totally outside the spirit of the game, so I don't recommend it. This is a good example of players sort of just using the rules, but doing it in a way that isn't quite as the game was intended. Now that will cause arguments. If you introduce a game that requires uh, knowledge of some type, or if you are advantaged by having a good vocabulary, or um, a good set of general knowledge or specific knowledge about a certain topic, then that can cause problems, especially with family gaming. It's very difficult for children to compete on the same level as adults if you're playing Trivial Pursuit, for example. You're asking for, um, for problems. Even if, you work, even if the children play to a children's set and the adults play to an adult set, you're never going to get a situation that's balanced well enough for people to feel like they have, for everybody to feel like they have a fair chance of winning. So if someone feels like they don't have a fair chance of winning, possibly because in a dexterity game, for example, that could be that they don't have the fine motor skills, either they're old, older or they're younger than other players, and that's going to prevent them from playing as well as everybody else. That's going to cause problems, and you want to try and avoid that situation if you can. Some games... Uh, are very bound in terms of luck. They're very bound to luck. They require luck for everything. And these games, uh, if you're down on your luck, if you're not throwing the right things uh, or flipping the right cards, then you can just get really low. Right? You can, you can go from being quite happy to play at the beginning to just thinking, I'm never going to get a one or two that I need to, to get off the mark in a game like Sorry for example, which is what you need to start. You can't even start the game and everybody else is halfway around the board. You can't even start and it's not even your fault. So when players have this lack of control, then they'll start to feel upset or angry or possibly worried about the situation. And you want to avoid those sorts of things as well. Another problem is when a player might take a long time thinking about what they're going to do. This is commonly known as analysis paralysis. And you'll see this in some of the more complicated games, the more strategic games, when what you do this turn won't just have an impact on this turn, but it'll have an impact on future turns. And generally, choice in games is a very good thing because you feel more in control and less likely to blame luck for your problems. You know, but you do have to blame yourself for them, and this can cause another problem that you want to do the best that you can. You want to think through the strategies. But if everybody's playing in turn, and you've got one player who's holding everything up whenever it comes to their turn, that that is really difficult to live with. And, and it's very hard to maintain your patience if you're... Well, you don't just have to be a younger player. It could, it could be anybody that really struggles with that. Um, particularly anyone with a sort of attention deficit problem, they're, they're going to really struggle with that. So finding games where, um, there is, where, where you're playing simultaneously or indeed finding strategies to combat that analysis paralysis is a really good idea. Um, younger players, when they're learning the game, a new game, or when they're trying to play their best, may reveal information to others that they shouldn't really reveal. So uh, they might just need help finding a place on the map, but that will give everybody else information about what they're trying to do, where they're trying to go, for example. 
Um, and so, so, uh, so that would be a case in Ticket to Ride um, that we talked about before, that you've got destinations and they're written on them. There's a picture of the map which gives you a general idea about where they are. But some of the place names, they're difficult to read. It depends which version you're playing. Now, there's a Scandinavian version. If you're not familiar with Scandinavian words, and not many of us are, then that might be quite hard for you to recognise that that's the right word. Particularly if you've got a child who's got dyslexia, then, then that's that's going to that, that's going to that's possibly going to be a problem. So they might reveal information about where they're trying to get to, just so you can help them find where it is on the map. And then they've got then they can get picked on because everybody else knows where they're going, and that can make that child feel really bad. So find so if if that's a problem in your house. We need to find strategies so that that child can get the information with you without from you without being treated unfairly. Uh, lastly, this is the eighth possible trigger. Uh, you might be playing a very complicated game that means you have to keep referring back to the rule book. And what happens then every time you have to refer to the rule book? You know the the, tent, the, the kind of the uh, the pace is going. You're playing. You're playing. Oh, I don't know how to do this, but we've got to go and look in the rule book and everything drops. And then you have to pick it back up again. Right, I know how to play. Let's start again. Everybody refocuses. You get back into the game. Oh, I don't know what to do here. Let's look at the rule book. Oh, it's gone again. This stopping and starting, this losing pace, this kind of lack, this, this drop of momentum can really get people angry and it can just you know you just want to oh I can't be bothered if it's that complicated if there's so many rules I can't be bothered so uh, so first of all identify what the triggers are in your family there may be many others these are just eight common ones that I've seen identify what the triggers are and then you're in a much better position to have to, to start developing some strategies to combat them these triggers are all in the board game family and in here, there are other ideas and suggestions about how to avoid uh, arguments and tears and to make family game playing as harmonious as possible.